I have another uh, speaker on tap on talk, and he is who's a uh, and he is chief cloud officer at Vivio Technologies, and he's going to talk about uh, boosting MySQL performance. Um, let me see. Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, it's really low sound. Okay. Yes, we could. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, before uh, hand over to Jose, uh, let me remind my audience that uh, you can ask questions over Slack or a platform of choice, and uh, we'll get answers even we can't in the talk. We will answer it later on. So hand over to you, Joe Jose. Okay. Thank you. So uh, first of all. Uh, hi, uh, welcome to the Percona online conference and thanks for all the organizers uh, in Percona for organizing this event. It's a really big task to, to organize a conference, let alone an online conference where everybody is <laughs> distributed. So, um, hello, I'm Jose Luis Martinez. I'll be with you for the next hour or so of the night or the evening, or maybe the morning, depending on where you are. Here in Cozy Barcelona, it's it's morning. Um, okay. I want to advise you. Uh, this is not a database optimization talk. Okay, it's it is oriented. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not oriented towards optimization as, as such. So um, there are a lot of talks and documentation around optimizing queries and shaving query response time. Um, this talk is about having some type of default rules, knowing a bit better your database to, to have a conscious of what you're doing so you can so when you're creating your database, you get better performance by default. So I'm going to follow Donald Knuth's um, uh, quote here. No, pre-optimization is the root of all evil. Um, and just say, yeah, yeah, that's right. 97% of the time we shouldn't be thinking about performance, but, uh, and some of you will understand this talk about the, as, as being optimization. And I want to, to be very clear here. My objective here is to uh, teach you a bit more about how MySQL stores its data, how it organizes data, and what tools you have available. So you make performant databases, or you, you, make, uh, you, you make better decisions when you're designing. Because really, I've seen lots of databases over the years. I've been working in, in MSP for 19 years or so. And... Um, we were attending alerts 24 by seven for all types of platforms, like mostly online. And as you imagine, these platforms have databases below. I've learned a few lessons from all of these types of platforms that I want to share with you. So uh, mostly when I've seen database performance problems, it was with, with one or two, um, things. Mostly it was databases that some way were built a bit carelessly, uh, not on purpose, maybe just because the, the developer didn't know uh, much more, or databases randomly like optimized following some type of, uh, of learned rules, uh, but not knowing why they're following the, those rules. So, um, some of those worst performance databases were like denormalized for alleged performance purposes. These denormalizations were mostly done thinking that there would be some type of bottleneck somewhere, just to later find out that the decisions made there were not adequate. You, shouldn't, you should be thinking that initially you have to be in a mindset 
where you're looking for maintainability and correctness of your database. Uh, you will have time to denormalize when you know where the bottlenecks are. Also, some of the worst performance, uh, some of the worst databases in the, or some of the worst performers uh, had, uh, for example, selected MyISM as a storage engine because of preconceived performance issues. Um, this mostly obeyed some type of law that, that says that MyISM is faster than InnoDB which yeah was kind of true like 18 years ago uh but some news uh, i know db will perform equal or better than my ism in, in lots of cases in 99 percent of cases it is true that my ism has faster one thread performance but when concurrency kicks in uh which is very very natural in a database i know db will be faster um I've even seen some tables declared as memory with the memory storage engine for performance reasons. Uh, it results that memory tables can even be slower than InnoDB. The MySQL manual has a note in the memory storage engine that warns you so. So, um, so don't, don't do these things by default. No, the, uh, the result of pre-optimization, in my experience, has always been uh, what we'll call uh, death by code, uh, and infrastructure maintained around these optimizations, uh, like uh, bigger than you need databases, uh, lot, lot, lots of stuff. So. Uh, Another one of these categories of problematic approaches that I've detected is kind of uh, relying on um, relying on perform on parameter tuning to achieve performance. If you have a bad foundation, uh, or really tuning parameters will only put a pretty paper wrap around the the, the trouble. Don't get me wrong; it will get you out of some trouble. But it's not a good default strategy to have a bad foundation and try to fix it just by tuning parameters. You should tune MySQL parameters, especially if you're installing from OS distribution packages. The settings when you install from, uh, from Debian, for example, the distribution package, are, are thought for a shared server or some type of desktop um, environment. If you have a dedicated server, the default parameters are, are not performant, are not thought for a dedicated server. So, so please do tune MySQL defaults. There are uh, tools for that. Uh, it's just not the theme for this talk. Now, if, if I was young and my grandfather was going to give me one of those, you know, those distilled lessons learned through life, you know, it was through his long life, and he would probably say, you know, son, start with a good schema. Uh, lots of pro performance problems start with the data not being in the right place or the right format for achieving good performance. By default, just stick to third normal form. If you can, if you can take a while to learn about database design, please do so. It will be time very well invested. Here you have a link to a good talk about that. So, We've already covered grandpa's opinion, but what would grandma say? What would her life learn lesson be about databases? So it would be, son, please care for your data types. Over all the years I've spent looking at databases, I found that most developers are not aware of the implications of caring for data types. Is it their fault? No, even MySQL lets you start 
without too much knowledge of what's underneath. And we all haven't followed the same paths to development. So uh, MySQL will mostly work for most applications uh, without giving too much care to, to your data types. And you might go a very big stretch of time before learning about the implications of those data types, why they're there. And the, I'm going to try to improve that. So selecting the adequate data types helps the database perform better. Basically, this is due to the fact that reading and writing to disk is slow. Reading and writing to memory is fast. So what do databases do to perform? Well, they, they, they really try to do everything they can in memory. So the more data that fits into the system memory, the, the better the database will perform. That's a general rule. And it results that MySQL has a huge choice of data types to suit different needs. So let's start with our very first and basic data type, one that we should all probably be familiar with, integers. So integers are non-decimal numbers, one, two, three, whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and we've probably used int, no? And, and we think we're familiar with that data type. The int data type occupies four bytes on disk. An unsigned integer can store whole numbers from zero to 4,000 million, approximately. If we want negative numbers, the range halves for the positive numbers, uh, so it can store the same amount, more or less, of, ne of negative numbers. And now comes a surprise, which I've seen and done. I'm personally, th this surprised me when I learned it. It results that uh, have you have you ever declared an int one column? It results that int one is exactly the same as int ten. Really, the modifier doesn't do anything storage wise. An int one column can hold the exact same values as an int ten. So I can hold the value like nine thousand four hundred thirty two in an int one column. Um, the one doesn't modify really the range of, of the in column and it has the same range that I said before. So uh, to modify range really what MySQL has is, is the int family. So integers are a very big or a big family of, uh, of options. As you can see, we have, if we want less range, we can use tiny int, small int, medium int, which take up to, which take up one, two, and three bytes on storage. And the ranges go up to 255 for the unsigned tiny int, 65,000 for unsigned small int, 16 million for medium int, all of these unsigned. And the same rules apply by having the positive range when it's signed. So um, take care when choosing the, the, the int. If you're going for something that will be only positive numbers, choose, it, um, choose them unsigned. If we want more range than what an int can give us, if we're going to store numbers bigger than 4,000 million, that would be 4 billion for Americans, um, we would use a big int uh, that really has, think of uh, 18 with uh, 18 zeros. Uh, it's, it's a big, big, big number we can, we can store. 
if you are worried about the exact ranges, that's why we have the, the MySQL manual. The, 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 the manual specifies exactly um, what values we, we can go to. So now let's look at strings. So strings can cause some confusion, or at least they caused some confusion to me at the start, because we kind of think of them as uh, as, uh, as text, really. You know, the, the stuff that humans read and write. Uh, but MySQL maybe can take a different approach, or it can surprise us that the, the blobs uh, that are also uh, strings. So. Um, so so let's take a further look. No, this is, this phrase. I think this phrase uh, resumes uh, very well what strings are in MySQL. So let's read it. Strings are sequences of bytes with a char set and a collation. So MySQL treats sequences of of bytes, just raw sequences of bytes, bytes one after the other. Uh, as uh, as strings, and it gives them um, a data types for that. Those are the binary and the bar binary data type. So if we want to store a set of 30 random bytes for, from, let's say, a random number generator or from a a piece of a binary file, um, we would use binary or var binary for that. Remember, that's just a sequence of bytes. If in change, we want to store a quote from a book, for example, we would use another data type. The bytes that come from the machine really need to map to characters. And here is where the rest comes in, uh, where char sets come in. A char set is a mapping from a value, from the value of a byte to its graphical representation. So here uh, we have, for example, in Latin one that uses one byte per character. Uh, that byte number 41 is an uppercase A and byte number 61 is a lowercase A. We have, for example, in, in Latin one, since it's a single byte, it can represent 255 or so characters, which some are really not printable. So we can think it's in the ballpark of, of 200 uh, printable characters. So this is kind of dates back to the times where memory and storage were so scarce that only English characters got values mapped, you no, know, a byte got mapped to uh, to English characters. And this result in, resulted in ASCII, which even had some extra space for some symbols. But when, but Europeans remapped the upper bytes in ASCII to not have symbols, uh, putting in like accented vowels and characters with them lots. Other languages had also uh, to, to map bytes to characters. And for example, Japanese writing had another map and this had to be multi-byte because there's more than 255 uh, Japanese characters. So one of the bad things about all of these encodings, so-called encodings, is that texts from different languages couldn't be represented together in the same string. So. Unicode, also some people referred to it as UTF, came to solve this for us. Unicode has standardized and mapped almost all characters known to humans. So UTF uses, uses what's called the multi-byte representation. So one of the most used encodings is UTF-8. 
that mostly occupies, as you see here, one byte and mostly maps to Latin one for the lower um, characters. But uh, for extended characters or uh, for example, um, uh, an uppercase A with uh, an open accent, um, it uses two bytes. This is uh, an encoding called UTF-8 MB4. MB4 stands for multibyte 4. Uh, we'll see a bit more about what this uh, is uh, later. The important bit is to understand that we use encodings that can that can uh, occupy more than one byte per, per character or per character we see on a screen. And for computers, a char set is not enough. We need some. We need to sort strings. We need to order them, and for that we need extra rules. And that's where collations come in. Collations are a set of rules which tell the computer how to order those characters or what, uh, um, what weights, what different weights they have between them. So, so when we do, for example, in MySQL, an order by uh, uh, a column that has a char set and a collation, a collation is the, the, the ordering for those characters. Uh, it can decide, for example, if the, these two A's are the same thing and orders them correctly, or if, for example, the under K, uh, the, um, the lowercase A is equivalent to uppercase A. That would be a CI. This CI here is, stands for case insensitivity. So, MySQL has a data type for strings that have associated a char set and a collation. And these are the char and the varchar uh, data types. Also, we, we said that uh, since char is uh, since uh, when we talk about char and varchar, we have to talk about their char set and their collation. So uh, when you declare a column, uh, you will often declare, well, UTF-8, MB4, Swedish CI. And that gives, the, um, that gives the column the knowledge about how uh, the, the bytes are ordered and to what characters they map. We normally don't specify this. Because uh, in MySQL, you have table defaults, which uh, a table can have a default char set and collation and a database default also. So uh, you may have never selected this uh, even, and, but, it, but it's really underneath, OK? So uh, let's take a look about the, the, uh, at the chart data type. So the char data type is for fixed length strings. And it, you remember that binary sequences of bytes are also strings. So MySQL handles char and binary storage in exactly the same way. It optimizes storage space, or this data type optimizes storage space when the length of the strings that are stored in a column are when all of the data is the same length. So a binary 10, this time the modifier does do something, uh, reserve 10 bytes on storage for the value. So let's think, how much space does a char 10 reserve? And remember, I have to say, what char set is, is this in? And because Latin 1 is a single byte encoding, it values in a char 10 uh, column occupy 10 bytes. Remember that if you're storing lots of values that don't have 10 characters, you're really wasting storage space. So if you have just 
y and n in a binary in a char 10 column you're wasting 10 bytes per uh, per each value now if you select an encoding like utf8 which is up to three bytes mysql will reserve 30 bytes for the value as you see here we have like normal characters and here we have unicode uh, stars that occupy three bytes so and that's almost always we have to know that i know db has an optimization where it will reserve 10 bytes minimum but if the value really occupies more than 10 bytes it will consume that space. Uh, so, so when we're declaring char 10, char, we, we're, um, most of the time we would say a char 10 and UTF-8, UTF-8 can take up to three bytes uh, for a character. We would say, okay, that occupies 30 bytes. And that would be um, true most of, the, most of the time for most storage engines, except for inodb which does this small optimization for you. But I have, and I have to caution to you as, as to one fact. You should use UTF MB8, uh, sorry, UTF8 MB4 by default. The MB stands for multibyte. So this char set uses up to four bytes per character as really standard UTF-8 does. Uh, the UTF-8 I was mentioning before that occupies three up to three bytes per character is just an alias for UTF-8 MB3, for the UTF-8 MB3 char set. This encoding was an initial encoding that MySQL adopted that has one big drawback, really can represent four byte characters in Unicode. So uh, this means it can't represent an important set of characters in Unicode, that's emojis, which are really part of UTF-8. And, and sometimes you will find databases that can't hold uh, those characters. So by default, uh, if, you, if you're aiming for uh, correctness and you want to, um, to store um, UTF values or Unicode values, uh, just choose UTF-8 MB4 by default. So back to our strings. We've seen the binary and chars together because of how they're stored on disk, really. And we're missing, we, we haven't talked about bar char and bar binary. So let's take a look at them. Bar binary, bar binary and bar char are variable length storage. They have a string size marker that tells them how many bytes follow to form the string. So in this example, Percona, which has seven characters, occupies one, two, three, four, eight, and eight bytes on disk. Online, which has seven, uh, uh, sorry, uh, online, which has six characters, occupies seven bytes, one in the Latin one char set. The 10 character string 2020 space five stars occupies 21 bytes, one for the marker and 20 for the contents. So for var chars, the rule is really that one byte for the length plus the length of what you're storing. Except that, well, and this is, there's no exception to this, uh, but I've seen something curious and it's that there are bigger var chars than we think. I don't know why really. Um, I've seen databases plagued with var char 255 when developers tend to use VARCHAR255, I do too, when 
we don't know the length or where the or where the length of the string is kind of unknown. And it kind of makes you think that Vartar 255 is the biggest available Vartar we have. When really Vartars can go up to 65,000 characters. So uh, I have to caution you also about this. Uh, my, uh, sorry, and when it does this, when we go over Vartar 255, uh, the byte, the, the length marker, instead of one byte, occupies two bytes. So I d do have to caution you that uh, MySQL has a maximum row length. So that is all the bytes of all the columns that you have in a table, one after the other in a table, cannot go over 65 kilobytes. If you put a Vartar 65,500 in a table, you will only be able to add columns that can occupy another 35 bytes. So uh, take this into account if you're going to put very big Vartars in, in your table. And you may be having an idea here. I've said that I've seen lots of databases with Vartar 255 all over the place. It really looks pretty innocent because you think that I'm just wasting one byte more than what's actually stored. And, and then you start to do complex queries and the, the database blows up. Uh, so in, I, surprise, in-memory tables are fixed width. So bar chars are converted to chars in temporary tables in memory. So all of those bar char 255 columns are now inside of MySQL treated as converted to char 255 in those memory tables. So now that that innocent var char 255 that only contains a y or an n it makes the database use up lots of extra memory when there uh, when there's a temporary table involved and don't think that it's difficult to create a temporary uh, table when applying order buys or or more than trivial queries it's quite uh, easy to do so uh, suddenly just declaring everything as a var chart 255 is not that good of an idea. So if you're worried about having large strings in your database, MySQL does have data types for you. They are the blobs, the binary large objects. And you're saying, aren't you talking about big text strings? And the same happens with the uh, with uh, blobs as with uh, as with uh, chars and uh, as with binaries and chars. That we have one type for strings of bytes that's a blob, the binary large object, and we have another one for blobs with a char set and a collation that appropriately is called text. So the text data type uh, and the blob data type can hold up to 65 Ks of, uh, of data. And the one common and unexpected problem with blobs is that you declare a text field because blobs and text also just like var, uh, var char and var binary are stored the same on disk. It's just that text have a text have a um, uh, a char set and a collation. So um, one of the common and unexpected problems with blobs is that you declare a text field and suddenly down the line, it starts to get truncated. For example, if you use it to store some HTML, which can get big fairly quickly. Uh, this is because that blob has a 65K limit. 
and the solution to this is typically to use another um, another data type in the blob family, which is medium text or medium blob, which can hold up to 16 megabytes, which is normally enough uh, for, for stuff you want to put inside of a database. I would say that if you are storing things bigger than 16 megabytes in a database, you should be aiming to store those things outside of the database, like in a file system or in, in, in an external object store, like for example, like WSS S3. And uh, there is another data type here called tiny text and tiny blob, which really it's, it's looks innocent like a varchar, uh, as it can hold up to, you know, be, you could say this is like a varchar 255. Um, for for uh, tinier texts, but I don't recommend using this, and we'll see why. Because if you were thinking that you could just substitute Bartar 255 or unknown uh, unknown text, like unknown length text with tiny text. Uh, yeah, so you don't have to worry about declaring the, the 255 or the, the size. You're really in for a surprise because uh, when a blob field participates in a select and there is need for a temporary table, the temporary table goes directly to disk. And as we know, disks are orders of magnitude slower than system memory and in general can only do one read or write at a time so they act as a big bottleneck for queries so so you receive a surprise if you have uh, lots of blob um, or text columns in your tables because your database blows up again so don't use indiscriminate blob fields There are some additional data types for like tinier, small sets of values. And enum is one of the ones that I like a lot for people to, to know about the, its existence. Uh, enum is a good data type for when you have to pick one value from a list of possibilities. It will occupy just one byte in storage, but as selects and inserts are concerned, it looks like a string. So uh, this is a good solution for a field that would hold a number that gets mapped to different string values. Like if you were storing a number that's one for yes and two for no, uh, enums are a good solution for you because you can uh, insert into the database the string yes or the string no, and really it's just occupying one byte on, on this. And enums can really hold up to 65,000 different possible values. And when, but, and when we store more than 255 values, it takes, instead of one byte, it takes two bytes to store an enum. But I wouldn't recommend about having uh, enums with that many values. So if you like the concept, the concept of enums, but are thinking that you have a field that could really take various values at the same time, we have the set data type. So for which you can insert its values separated by commas, and then you can use the find and set function to find if a value is active or not in that column. So, uh, but I have to tell you, uh, so if you have something like a, a, a non-exclusive uh, values like a pool, terrace, fence, and ward, and, and you want to say, okay, this, um, this house has a pool and fence. Um, this is okay. This is okay to store the data. It will store the data efficiently, but sets are not very good for finding stuff inside of them. You do have the function called find and set, but generally this doesn't use indexes. So um, I like to say that a good default option, if you're thinking about the set data type, is just to model uh, an NM relationship with, um, with the junction table, since that favors searchability and also permits you adding extra attributes and stuff like that. 
So now another data type, it's dates and times. We'll skim over this very, very quickly. Just know that we have specialized data types. We have specialized data types for, one second, please. Okay, we have um, we have special uh, we have specialized data types for uh, for storing values of date and times uh, with different ranges. Uh, what I want you to be conscious of is that, for example, if you're expecting a year column to hold values from from zero to nine thousand from year zero to year nine thousand ninety nine, you're in for a surprise because a year only has one byte. And um, and since one byte can only hold up to 256 possible values, uh, you can't hold what you were expecting maybe. So when you're using date, uh, date and time uh, data types, I like to take a look at the manual to see the range, uh, to see the range that, we're, that every data type has. Uh, the and also the there I always had like the the the, the questions about was selecting date time or timestamp. So date time and timestamp are like functionally equivalent, as in they hold the date and a time together. The difference is basically in range. A good rule of thumb is knowing that a timestamp column is a, a, a Unix epoch. So it's good for things that happen, happen now or will happen in the near future. That is like before year 2038. Uh, so finally, to, to, to end talking about data types, columns can be declared null or not null. Not null obliges a column to have a value, while nullable columns can be unknown or have a special value that indicates that this has this row has no value for this column. Uh, I recommend to set a column nullable wherever it makes sense in your model, and this gives the database as this gives the database hints to perform better on some queries. So usually we find lots of uh, data. I'll skim very, very, very fast over this because uh, time is uh, running out. Um, sometimes we find data that is not uh, what we expect. Uh, if we were to store IP addresses uh, with the stuff that we just uh, learned, we would be thinking about 12, you know, th uh, four positions with three, um, with up to three characters, that's 12 and three dots, that's uh, 15 characters. So we would be thinking immediately about a varchar 15. When really, if we dig a bit deeper, an IP address really is a four byte value. So we use an int to store it. MySQL even has functions to go from an internet address to number and from uh, an internet number to address. So when you store the IP addresses as an int in, in a table, you have helper functions to, to undo the codification. Uh, another typical example would be, let's choose a data type for, uh, for storing a uh, hash of the value of a hash. So we, we're going to store MD5 signatures of texts and we count and we say, okay, we know that uh, MD, uh, that hash functions output fixed length strings. So we're immediately thinking about the fixed length data types and we count and we say, okay, MD5 has 32 characters, but MD5, is really, really, really a 128 bit or 16 byte value. So we can represent that in the database as a, we can store it as a binary 16 really. And we, and it occupies half of, of, of what we of what uh, we would do with the char 32. 
with the hex and unhex functions uh, from MySQL, we can undo the codification. So if you look carefully, you will find more mass data types around. I do recommend one thing though, don't go out of your ways to store them optimally if you're not going to store lots of them or, they don't par or if they don't participate in indexes. So we haven't covered all data types yet. Uh, there are still uh, decimal, floats, JSON, et cetera. Here you have a link. Uh, the, and to the best, these are the best uh, pages for um, in regards to data types, because all of them are on, are in one page, and it shows you the the storage requirements also. So, as a general rule of thumbs regarding data types, smaller is better. So, now let's change themes and talk a bit about indexes. And did. Did you see what I did there with the finger index? Uh, sorry about the bad joke. Um, anyway, uh, when we talk about indexes, the first and most important index of a table is the primary key. Did I say change the theme? I'm sorry, it's back to data types uh, because we have to choose a data type for our primary keys. But I swear you this will be uh, easy. So it's a good practice to just default to an unsigned int as your primary key with an autonomic attribute. If you are expecting less than 16 million rows, you can select a medium int. Or if you're still expecting less than 65,000 rows, you can select the small int. Uh, remember to use the unsigned since autonumerics never go into the negative range. So if you forget the unsigned, you will basically half the number of rows your table can store. Um, and what will you do with your natural keys? Well, we put unique, unique indexes on them. And this is, uh, this is really a standard database modeling technique called using surrogate keys. You can find a good article in Wikipedia about them and where, where they come from and why they're useful. The interesting part about using integer surrogate keys by default for us is that it's very performant since SinoDB, our default storage engine anyways, stores the entire key the, the entire primary key on every secondary index. So every time we create an index on a table, we get the whole primary key on it. So tables with big keys, like imagine a char 20 key, uh, have very big indexes because all of the values of, uh, 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 of that char 20 are repeated in the, are in the index. So, uh, and another detail about, um, about key selection is that I've seen a lot of databases that default to big int for their surrogate keys. So uh, I just have a trick here that, that I want you to, um, to, to know, to, just as a rule to select if you need that big int or no. Uh, and that is to compare it with some other kind of magnitude. And I have a proposal for you. So we know that epochs in Unix have four bytes, right? Just like an unsigned int. We also know that the epoch has been counting every second since January 1st, 1970. And that it will run out in 2038. So with an int, we can register one row every second for 68 years or two rows per second every 34 years. Do you really st still really need a big int for your table? So let's talk about indexes. Let's play a game of find the cat. Indexes help us find values in tables Tell you the cat is mm, here. 
So default advice for indexes is that you index the two sides of relations. One is already indexed since it's the primary key, right? So please index the other side with the non-unique index. It will let the database take better decisions when performing queries. Also, since we have defaulted to InnoDB, please use references to make the database enforce integrity between customers and orders in this example. That way, there will be no orders without a corresponding customer. This is better than trying to hand enforce consistency just because you heard that reference constraints are slow, which they are really not. I've seen too many databases holding unreferenced foreign keys due to not having constraints. And this many times creates bugs and, and unexpected data to pop up depending on how you're querying the data um, and causes lots of problems. And you can have the database do the dirty work for you. So I recommend you doing that just by default. The other thing is to um, is to use the exact same data type on the two ends of a relation. This makes the database's job easier, and there is no motive to do the contrary. So find the cat. This one is a hard one. <laughs> so indexing tips for NM relations or junction tables. The primary key of a junction table, like the contract has customer table in this example, by default should be the combination of the two tables that it participates uh, primary keys. So you don't need a surrogate key on these types of tables. Also, if your primary key is contract ID, customer ID, it's good to create a unique index the other way around on customer ID, contract ID since this lets the database walk the relationship the other way around in an efficient manner. And the database will use that index depending on the query, although you might think it wouldn't. And I've seen lots of databases speed up just putting that in index in because the database normally uh, knows how to do it faster. And the small trick also is to utilize ZinoDB's features and that's only index customer ID, non-unique. Since inodb already has the contract ID in the index, that's the primary key on the index, we only need to index customer ID as that works the same as indexing customer ID and contract ID. So find the cat. And I imagine that you guys are, are scanning the table no, I, sorry, scanning this image, trying to find the cat. That's what the database does when it doesn't have indexes. It's here. So we know that indexes are used to find values in columns quickly without having to scan all the values in a column. Indexing helps the database perform queries faster at the price of being a bit slower on inserts and updates. I've seen a lot of databases with indexes in the right places, but because the developers were really thinking, I'll index this field because I filter it by it a lot. But the database was not using those indexes because of how the queries were written. So a tip here, as a general rule, when you query the database, don't operate on fields since it makes it impossible for the database to use indexes. Some examples of operating on columns are here, using functions on a column, multiplying, adding, dividing, subtracting, using like without a prefix. All of these queries can be rewritten to allow the use of indexes. So with a bit of algebra, we have to think that we want to isolate the variables. So the variable is the column. And um, so as you can see here, we want to convert, we want to isolate columns. So we take the 2000 and we want to put it on the right side. So it will come subtracting 2013 minus 2000, where column bigger than 13. 
this uses an index. A bit more contrived the example. The concatenation of a column is xxxx.com. So we can really split that and say where column one is xxx and where column two is com. Uh, when we're doing a date where dates are fairly they are efficient when we do betweens. When we don't operate on this date with that fun with the year function. But we still have two challenges that we cannot solve yet that are we're finding set full column and we're uh, and um, we're column like anything.com we can use the the what i like to call the old switcheroo so we basically start um, consulting another column we create a column that has in this example in the find and set pool we create a column that's called has pool equals one uh, sorry that that's called has pool that has one or zero in function of if the row has a pool or not. And we query that and we index that uh, column. And with the, um, with the dot com, with anything dot com, we reverse all the values in the column and we consult the column by prefix. So now it can, now these queries can use indexes. Before MySQL 5.7, we had to create those columns and maintain them on update and insert. On MySQL 5.7 and 8.0, we have a feature called generated columns. These columns can be calculated from other column values and not stored on disk, but they can be indexed. So this technique has become more accessible with time and it's a good thing to, to know when trying to very efficiently. So basically, we, we would set uh, in the olden days, we would create a new column and we would do this type of update to put the values in with the generated columns in MySQL 5.7 or 8.0. We would use the generated column with this expression or with the reverse expression. And that's it, we would query that column. So, okay, last attempt to find the cat. So we have come to an end. We've seen lots of stuff. Don't be worried if you haven't been able to digest everything. This takes some time and some practice applying it to get comfortable. You will always be able to return to this presentation or use the links provided the next time you start writing a create table. Knowing the data types and the basics of indexing will make your database perform better by default without thinking too much about it. So I hope I have given you a series of good default practices for MySQL and most importantly, the reasons why we apply them. So you understand where uh, to, to follow the, um, the default practices and where to not follow them. So thank you for attending. You can contact me via Twitter and LinkedIn. I'll be on the Slack channel to, um, for, for a while to answer questions or so. Thank you. Okay, so I would say it was a great talk, Jose, on boosting MySQL performance. I would really appreciate the relationship you're trying to create with finding cats or indexing things. It was it was really nice. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>